before the tape. Good morning. Welcome to the 36th Color Lab Convention. Today is April 7, 2009, and this is the Winning Ways New, Initi- New Initiative session. I am Larry Davenport, and your panelist today on my left is Tom Rudebach. If you looked in the um, description in directions for this session, it is an open forum. Uh, so that we know what we're going to open forum about, I thought I'd give a, a few brief comments and some context to begin with. We have two efforts within Color Lab which have been coming together. One of those you may have, may remember is called the Program Policy Initiative or the PPI. And another one is called Winning Ways, which is something that you can find, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, through our website and through publication and direction. Um, the PPI was an attempt to try to solicit, if you will, ideas from people to, about what they want to try that's going to help grow our activity, whether it be uh, a way to keep the people in your hall, a way to get new people in your hall, whatever it might be. And so there's been an effort over the past uh, several years uh, to get people thinking about that and to get people experimenting as to what will be successful for you and in your area. Uh, this is, um, in many ways, I think, intended to be a grassroots kind of a program that we want to provide the the um, uh, the, the focus uh, to think about it. But any successes we're going to have from any experiments that we do is really going to come from our dancers, our organizations, yourselves as as callers and leaders in the activity. Uh, the other activity, which really comes out of the um, the RPM repo. Um, um, I wrote it down, recruit, promote, and maintain. The RPM committee uh, was the winning ways, and the winning ways has been a, 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 um, um, a way of reporting out successes of things that people have tried, a way of reporting out recognitions of clubs, uh, fest, um, organizations, federations that have been doing something that is deserving of recognition. Uh, how many of you, uh, just a question, how many of you have been on the Color Lab website? A few hands in the air. I see three, about three. And for the record, there's about uh, not quite 20 people in the room. Uh, how many people who know where the Color Lab website is? About the same hands, maybe one more that hasn't been on it, I think. I don't know. Um, it is www.collarlab.org. And if there's a lot of information available on that site, that's not we're not going to uh, do a description of the site today. But there's a lot of information on there. But if you get on that website and look at the left menu bar, you're going to see a a selection for documents. And when you you go to that, you'll be able to pick general documents. And when you get to the general documents uh, page, you'll be able to see on your right, you can select winning ways. And when I looked this morning, there are 36 uh, entries in the Winning Ways um, uh, section of of Collar Lab at the moment. So if I wanted to distinguish between Winning Ways and uh, the the, uh, Program Policy Initiative, as I said earlier, the Program Policy Initiative is really seeking ideas, and but not seeking ideas for Collar Lab to act on, but seeking ideas for yourself and other people that hear your ideas to act on. Uh, winning ways is an opportunity, a mechanism to report those successes back out so that people have a chance to see what others have tried and they can pick it up and try them themselves. Um, the uh, Recruit, Promote, Maintain Committee, uh, the RPM, uh, Mike Hogan, Chair, and Jerry Junk, Vice Chair. So if anybody wanted to know more about uh, uh, their efforts uh, with the winning ways, uh, uh, you could talk to them. What I also looked at, <clears throat> without making this a... Uh, that committee is meeting this afternoon, so you can look in directions. If you have an interest in going to uh, that committee, you can do that. Um, what I'm not doing, doing here is not to describe all the winning ways that were on there, but I thought um, it would be interesting just to go through a list of the types of things that are currently posted on winning ways. Um, people are talking about fun nights, introduction to square dancing, uh, success with multi-cycle, um, recruitment efforts that they have tried, one uh, report on there is that the club has uh, set out to give themselves goals as opposed to just uh, we come, we dance, uh, we put up a class, uh, we try to start a class, but they've they've gone to the effort of, of actually setting club goals and seeing if they could achieve those goals to, to grow their club. 
Uh, one uh, report in there is partnering with other organizations. This particular report had to par- partner with Life Steps, which apparently is uh, somehow associated with the uh, GM. I assume GM meant General Motors. Uh, uh, health-related um, uh, exercise program available to their employees, and so there's a partnership there between uh, that other organization and the Square Dance Club. Uh, one area put together a committee, a growth committee, just to, to have a forum to think about how to um, do that. Uh, a team group reports. Uh, uh, one club has changed their philosophy. They call themselves now a social club that square dances instead of a square dance club that socializes, and that has changed a little bit about how they think about it. Uh, some reports of successful uh, TV publicity, um, an effort to recruit former dancers, um, Saturday night specials uh, in one area, and I think other areas do this, where on a particular night of the month uh, uh, or the fifth Thursday or whatever, let's have all the clubs in the area get together and do a dance. In this particular case, they made sure the level of dance was was uh, a, a level that uh, was correct for anybody that showed up. If it uh, didn't include class at that time, uh, then it would be whatever the level that all the dancers in the hall could dance. If it included, uh, uh, if it was during class season, it would be a red light, green light, that that kind of an idea. Um, dancing in schools report, uh, theme nights, uh, trying to to um, uh, generate uh, interest. Uh, uh, they mentioned uh, the usual pie night, uh, but uh, they also mentioned uh, team night, and I'm not sure what they meant by team night as a theme. Uh, there's another area that apparently has a club that exists only to hold multi-tiered classes, so their intent is not to uh, recruit for their club, but to be an effort to recruit for clubs in the area. So uh, I'm not, I'm neither uh, endorsing nor not endorsing any of these, but I just wanted to give you a, a variety of what's currently out there if you go and look at the winning ways on the website. So what I'm hoping to do um, is, is first of all, I'll see if uh, Tom has any, any comments he wants to add to that. He's shaking his head no. For the for the tape, <laughs> no. I just, uh, as, as Larry mentioned, I we need to, we need to hear from you what is working, what has worked, uh, success stories, and we'll put a plug in. If if you haven't sent it to Winning Ways, and it's been successful, do that so other people can share in your successes. Absolutely. So what I'm hoping that we can, I can shut up at this point. What we can generate is some discussion. And this discussion can be things that you're currently trying, things that you've thought about trying, something that you think of just because you're sitting here listening to other people today. But the success of the next hour is going to be the participation from uh, all of you, not from Tom and myself. So I'm uh, asking if anybody wants to start with something they're doing in their area. In the back. And don't forget for the, uh, you know the routine, name, rank, serial number. Master Chief Petty Officer 5657. No, wait a minute. Wrong format. Virgil Forbes from Maryland. Actually, I'll be in here at 1 o'clock doing a session CPR for square dance clubs, talking about one of the ones that's on Winning Ways, my uh, accelerated learning program for squares, uh, where it doesn't shorten teaching time. It just front loads it with a very intense weekend aimed at our professionals and families for whom weekend is recreation time and weeknight is for homework and going to bed early. So moving recreation into their recreation time. Uh, So uh, Jameo and I will be in here this room at 1 o'clock to present the accelerated learning program for squares. Speak up. We don't want blank space on this CD. Now, Tom, I don't know if it was explained, but since I'm the moderator, I get to get, delegate you as the panelist to fill the open space. You've been looking. Never mind. <laughs> Who's next? In, I see a couple of hands went up. Good. Uh, Mike Callahan from New York. This happened about two years ago. Uh, Three, two, two other callers in our area, myself, we had a plus, called it a plus blast for people who already knew mainstream and had gone through most of the plus program but wanted more of a, um, more experience at it. And what we did is we took a Saturday 
And we said, okay, we're going to start at noon, and we're going to go through the whole plus list. And uh, we ended at 5.15. We had three tips an hour, um, each caller alternating tips. And we had eight squares show up to this. And it was... Uh, we, I've never tried a, a blast class for new people, but this seemed to work out real well for people who were not sure of their plus calls and wanted some more uh, experience with that. And it was a very successful day. It was a workshop type of thing, no singing calls. Uh, but we had, uh, like I say, three tips an hour, five-minute breaks. And uh, I would say 95% of the people hung in there for the five hours and 15 minutes just to get through all those, all those plus calls. And it was a success, successful day. Super. I saw a hand up, Dana, in the back. Ron Shane with the 59th National oh, no, Square Dance. I'm sorry, it wasn't Dana. My glasses are bad. <laughs> Ron Shane with the 59th National Square Dance Convention in Louisville next year. Um, one thing the Kentucky Square Dance Association started last year, uh, last fall, was uh, started working with the uh, local YMCAs. The YMCA's, um, as you know, are mostly uh, into uh, exercise programs and things like that. Uh, they gave us free facilities on Sunday afternoons, provided their uh, membership roster, their phone number listing, uh, the list they had, email address listing, and they they printed up the flyers for us. They, uh, all we had to do was tell them what to put on it, which, you know, we were better at than they, they didn't know that much about square dancing. Um, they charged the, the participants, uh, 250 a person per session. We provided the, our association provided a caller. Uh, one in Shepherdsville had 32 students in class and they have since formed a new club. Uh, from that, from that. The only thing is, each Y operates under different, uh, rules, so you have to, uh, tailor your program to them. What, ours in our area are limited to 10 weeks, so you, uh, get a 10 week class started, and then you move, like they move to a lot, li- the library in Shepherdsville to continue their lessons, and then they move to, I think, to a church for their graduation, or no, a convention center to their graduation conference center, and then to a church hall for to, to start their club. But we're now working with three other um, uh, wives in the Louisville area, and uh, it looks very promising. Uh, we've They've been building wise in our area. I don't know about other parts of the country, but we have three new wise built in the Louisville area just in recent years. And they uh, are very active. We've got a new one in New Albany, Indiana. That the parking lot is full almost all week, and especially on weekends. So we're definitely going to work with that one, try to get something going there. It's a perfect way to utilize their membership roster, their mailing list, and all this. Great. Now, part of our open forum is if anybody has questions or additional comments on something somebody else has said, um, please, this, this is a, a discussion as opposed to a, a, a series of, re, of, of reports, so uh, we can use it for whatever you like. I appreciate that. That's another good uh, uh, partnering with another organization. Anybody else? So while we're waiting for another hand to go in the air, I'll, I'll mention something I've been thinking about with a club that I've got, and I haven't decided whether it's workable or not yet. But uh, I have a struggling club that uh, probably, if it continues to struggle along, it will struggle until it falls below critical mass and it will disappear. Uh, anybody heard of any clubs like that? <laughs> but we dance in a community center. And uh, it depends on whether the club would be interested or not, but I've been thinking about the idea that uh, we could advertise that we're an open uh, open door. Anybody would like to come in and do a little dancing. We have a at least our core of club that if nobody came in our door, we have our regular dance. But if people trickled in, uh, uh, we would do whatever was the right thing to do for that night and just see if that over time gradually established that, gee, there's a square dance over there. 
and we can go to. Uh, the idea isn't that we're starting classes that way, but the idea is that we uh, we have a club. Uh, we can dance if we if if on that given week nobody shows up, but we're willing to dance with whatever the program is, a fun night or 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 something a little bit more than that, depending on who comes back, as a way to just sort of grow our presence in that area. So I haven't actually acted on that yet. I'm not sure whether the club would agree or that, but I'm curious what people think about that. Tom, we got a. I'm Stephen Cole, and I live in Tempe, Arizona. Um, I call. I moved to Arizona about a year and a half ago, uh, ish, and I have yet to really kind of establish myself as a club caller. I uh, came close a couple times, but I am. I travel all over the state. I've been at three of the four corners of the state. One of the four corners is up on the rim near the Grand Canyon in a, a town called Sholo. Sholo. Ha- is an island. It is isolated. It is far, far away from the beaten path. They lost all of their callers. They either retired, died, or moved. So they have guest callers all the time, and I go up. It's a three-hour trek one way, and they put me up overnight. It's been terrific. When they don't have a caller, they've been finding some records and trying to flip them over, and finally they said, okay, we can't afford, our dwindling membership can't afford to pay for this beautiful hall that they had built. They built it themselves 40 years ago, and it is hardwood floors. It is one of the best places I've ever called. So they somebody said, well, what are we going to do? Uh, our round dance leaders are gone. Our square dance leaders we have to import. Uh, they've, they're snowbird types that come in the summertime because it cools off. They do have live callers then, but come September through March, they got nobody. So they said, well, why don't we have a community dance? And when people say community dance, they think like Kyle Campbell's community dance program where they're getting together and they do contours and lines and whatnot. They just said – they used the term, but what they said was we need to bring money into the institution to maintain what we've got and maybe get some interest. At the end of the day, what they decided to do was hire a band. It was a rock band that plays all kinds of music. And their dance, club dance, was on a Saturday, so they had the dance on a Friday night. They own the hall. It's – And it has the kind of room where the back, the rafters open up and out to a patio. So what they did was they had this dance. And then they invited line dance instructors to come out. And they invited, uh, who else? Just anybody that did aerobics instructors, anybody that did any sort of line or any kind of dance at all. And they told the band, if you have somebody that teaches dances that go with your music, bring them out. What they did, and then they charged a real fee. At the door, and I when I say real fee, it's not two dollars a head. Uh, I think they charged either. I think for kids under the age of sixteen, it might have been five dollars. Grown up, seven, seven or eight, and they had a huge turnout. Uh, I think they had a hundred people come to this dance, and what that did was it paid their bills for a month. And they said, "Wow, this is great!" And what that allowed them to do was it did two things. It was a social outing for the club, meaning that it was outreach to them, meaning they were able to say, hey, this has been put on by the, uh, I can't even think of the club's name now, it's um, the Rim Rompers of Sholo, of the White Mountain Rim Rompers were able to say, we put on this dance for you, and we're going to have lessons eventually, but you, you're not, you don't have to come. We just come and dance this night. We're going to do it every, uh, every couple Fridays or once a month. And... The outreach that they generated has given them a pool of people to say, "Hey, we know where we know where the hall is. We were interested in doing this, and uh, maybe learning how to square dance." They did some basic quadrille kind of squares, just real simple, uh, at one point in the evening. But it provided them um, outreach as well as a funding source and a visibility that they would not have gotten had they just stayed inside and said, well, I guess we're just going to fold. So uh, that is one of the things I thought was was very interesting on their part. Who's next? Uh, Ruth Edison from New Jersey. I'm here for Ron Kapnick. He's the caller. I'm not a caller. <laughs> and no, uh, no disclaimers are necessary. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have been doing multi-cycle, which uh, Randy had done Randy Page, and we find that 
in September when people call and we say, well, we only register people, we only start in September, and, you know, it's like three weeks into or four weeks into the uh, session, so, you know, you have to wait until next September. So we we decided we would start like Randy did, and then after 10 weeks, we have a uh, we have a, a fall session, and then we have a summer session too. And uh, our fall session is the one that where we get most people. They really, you know, they are willing to wait until two months or three two months at least, and they'll come. And we have improved. We had um, we only had I think our our last session in the fall we had 20 people, and. Uh, we added them to uh, cross trails to our square club. There was a club up, not a club, a federation up in our area last, I think it was last fall, decided to approach the homeschool people. They were very successful in getting numbers. The federation paid for the hall rent, the they solicited a, bun- a group of callers up in that, that taught up in that area to each donate three or four weeks. They used a cycle of callers. It went well until they talked. They, it was free. It went well till they it talked about having them start their own group or their own club, or integrated them integrate them into another club. The minute they tar- started talking money, they left. To my knowledge, we've got one one gentleman still dancing. So I don't, I'm not sure what the, the moral of that is. Is free not always good? Stephen Cole again from Tempe. I... I'm reminded of things when people start talking. So go, I mean, I hope you all say something because, oh, yeah, it comes to mind. When I moved from Seattle, the gentleman, there was a newer caller that I helped train, uh, ended up filling one of the four clubs I was calling for. Uh, his name was Cliff Nichols. And Cliff was, his father was a caller. And it was one of those things where his father uh, was a caller, but he was like, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with square dancing. And I, uh, no, 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 no. And finally, after his father passed, he's like, you know, I don't have this connection. He tried to reconnect with his father's roots. And so he became a caller and was working very, very hard at it. Took over the club I was calling for, but they danced on Sunday nights. And he met somebody that said, I'd really like to learn how to square dance, but I really don't want to do lessons. I'd really like to go, to, we'd like to do a square dance. And I have some friends and some families that would like to do one. So, but we can't do Sundays. Sundays is out. So he said, well, I'll tell you what I can do. We'll, we'll find a place and we'll, we'll, uh, it was at a, I think a, a little offshoot of a community center and, uh, it cost X number of dollars. They raised enough to do the rent for the hall and give him a couple dollars. It wasn't a lot. And they had a great time. And he said, well, if you want, I can te- le- teach lessons. And they're like, no, 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 no. We don't, we don't want lessons. We just want to come and dance. He said, well, do you want to come and do this next month? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to do it next month. We'll do it again. So like four months in a row go by. And every every time, do you want to do it? No, 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 no lessons. We just want to come and dance. And it was kind of styled like an ABC type dance, but not really, which for those of you that don't know, uh, uh, the Rio Grande people in Rio, the College Association in Rio Grande, Texas, came up with an idea of where it's uh, come as you come as you are, dance for a little bit, but no lessons. So after the third or fourth one, and then they started saying, can we do a little bit more often? Can we do another one? So like after the fifth one, which was on a, every other, became every other week, they said, well, you know what? We're having a really good time. Maybe, maybe lessons would be something we would enjoy. And what they did was they transitioned from a once a month, let's dance every now and then to a almost a club. I mean, it, they're, they're working at it. They also don't have a destination in mind. They're not working at it as a, when I talked to them last, when I talked to Cliff last, he said, we're not looking at it as getting to mainstream. We're looking at it as taking lessons but dancing as much as we can with the calls that we have. And nothing has made me more proud of this gentleman than him saying that I'm not worried about trying to turn out dancers or uh, club members. I'm trying to turn out dancers. And what it ha- then the other piece of it happened was that, well, they – 
the little pittance that they were coming up with wasn't paying for the hall. But what happened at the end of the day was that they were down. They started with two squares. They went to three. They were up to five of people, and now they're back down to four. They've got four that have stuck with it because it evolved naturally, not some, like, artificial, we're going to teach lessons and you're going to become a square dancer, and this is how it's going to be. It started out as them dancing and then becoming square dancers and becoming good square dancers, not just club members. And I, I'm really hoping to see in a year from now, because this started, this started this past November, I'm really hoping to see a year from now that he comes back and says it's just evolving and growing very organically, not artificially in any way where we're trying to just pump them up, pump them up, get them out, get them in, move them on. Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about as I've been listening is is that the the term outreach has come up, and, and outreach has come up without being a outreach to recruit to a class, but rather outreach to get people into square dancing. Um, and, and so... Uh, uh, that that's very intriguing to me as to how you can maintain a club, for instance. Uh, a one night a month you do something which is outreach that's not intended to ever necessarily recruit anybody but just be a place to come dance or or whatever. Uh, the other thing I'm curious about, going back to the gentleman in the back from uh, the Kentucky area, you talked about after the 10 weeks of the uh, YMCA, then you needed to transition to another place. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, uh, how you uh, sort of approached or how the area has approached uh, getting those folks interested in that transition as opposed to just seeing 10 weeks and done? Well, they they were enth- so enthusiastic that uh, they wanted to form a club. They had a few... In the class were former members of a folded club, the Bullock County Squares, that had folded maybe five years ago. So they did have a core there of people that had been in a club before. So when they moved, they moved to the library to to continue lessons, but at the same time, they started another 10-week course at the Y. So they had another group coming on. And they're going to continue this. They think it will be the Y is very enthusiastic about keeping this going. So there will be a feeder group coming in as long as the Y can keep classes going. But uh, the, the caller that we provided said that, well, you know, I, I've got a caller-run club, but he said I would like to get uh, this club going on their own because he's – getting near retirement he wants wants to get out so he said i need to get uh administration going here so he said uh can i get anybody to take the president he said if not i'll carry on and one guy said, held up his hand he said well you know i moved here from california he said i used to square dance years ago he said i'll take the treasurer's job the guy said oh that's the worst of the bunch he said i've already got me a treasure but they uh now have moved to a church, and like I say, they got a got a, a feeder organization set up there. That every ten weeks they get a new class started, as long as you know, as long as they keep keep coming. So we think that this will be a very good way to uh, help our club. Our club is dwindled down quite a bit, and I was asking someone. I said, "Well, is there a Y near nearby?" And they said, oh, "I don't think so." But we found out there is one down. The roadways, so we're going to, our club is going to work with that Y and see if we can provide our caller on Sunday afternoons and we've got a hall to move to after 10 weeks. So if we can get something going there and move them into our, move them into our hall. The other thing I'm just curious about before we before we go to the next one, you know, Tom was talking about earlier the fee structure and free then became not free and whatnot. But I'm just curious when you deal with a group like that, is the fee structure for that first ten weeks dictated by the Y? Yes, yes. Uh, they they set their um, um, you know they like I say that one it was two fifty a person per session. So, but it was their membership. Sure. And essentially, there's membership, and they would come in on Sunday afternoons and uh, come in there and pay their two fifty and take square dance lessons. So, when you transitioned them to another <laughs> hall, did you change the fees? Uh, or keep I it the think same? they're uh, going to uh, have, I guess, membership fees. I really don't know what the structure is. Okay. That's fine. I was just curious. Yeah, I know. I, I I'm curious too. I want to find out too what they're, what they've done too, but. Haven't had much contact with them in the last few months, so we're on the road so much with the with the national. Great, thanks. And I think we had another hand in the air. 
L. Reed from Collar Lab. I had a question about the why. I think you said that they gave you um, a names, the list of their membership list, and you drew from that. Well, do they have any concerns about you uh, essentially taking people out of there? Um, yeah, pass the mic back. Because of the work of Um Evidently not. Uh, not I haven't heard anything because they are so enthusiastic about their membership having this extra activity that evidently it doesn't seem to bother them. I know one club, one of our singles clubs in the past, used to go and have an exhibition at the uh, PWP, Parents Without Partners. Every year in the summer, they would have an exhibition, and they would get a large class of these PWP members. Well, after a few years, the PWP people finally realized that, you know, all of our members are going down to the down to Sunnyside Solos. So they blocked the, uh, cut the uh, exhibition off so they didn't get, you know, those people. But evidently the why is, um, you know, happy with it because they still get their why, their membership, but they just lose them for that, you know, just to go to that dance, uh, the, the club that, on that night. So evidently they're still going to the why for other other activities. I'm Betty Dutcher from Lamar's, Iowa, and I do work for the YMCA up in Lamar's. And uh, one thing about the Y, they work with people to encourage more uh, programs. So uh, I would say most of your Ys would work with people to get more programming in their areas. Thank you. Another hand in the air maybe somewhere? Up front. Uh, Mike Callahan again from New York. A couple of weeks, I got to go up to uh, North Bay, Ontario, Canada, which is about four hours north of Toronto, and I'm going to be doing an afternoon and evening dance. And they don't have any callers up there, but they do have a, a dance leader who has built a program using tapes and records to teach people. And uh, this was all set up, and about uh, six months ago, he emailed me. He said, when you come up, I have a beginner's class. Could you possibly do an extra hour? I said, sure. He says, how many in the class? He's about 30, you know, and there's no caller up there. And I said, well, how did you get all these people in your class? Well, they did the normal flyer routine and all that, he says, but we got a majority from them from one of our club members uh, who took it upon herself to call active couples in their church and issue a personal invitation to them that they're going to start a square dance group come on over for a fun night, that type of thing. So this is another case where the personal contact still works. But I think a lot of people should look into their churches for uh, for people. You know, these are the type of people you like to have in your group. And I don't think there's enough people that look into their churches to, to get new people. In the back? One of the things I keep hearing is classes and when they start to dance. I'm probably as guilty as everybody. But if we, uh, as callers and leaders, are doing our job, they're dancing the minute, not the minute they walk in the door, but two minutes after they walk in the door. And I think that's something, our, and it, terminology is hard to break, but I think we need to start at looking at new dancers, party dances, beginner dances, however you want to word it, but not, if, if possible, get rid of that word, word classes. Jim Mayo from New Hampshire. Uh, I'm providing Otto Watman's words here. Otto is a caller in the South who works with the uh, with churches a great deal and makes a quite comfortable living working for the churches. He has repeatedly made the point that we are taking the wrong approach when we go and take their people away to make our clubs. We could much more effectively go to the church and say, we have a way to provide a social activity within your church. And we can't do that if we are fixated on our 30 lesson, come join our organization style of square dancing. But we have a perfect activity for building social interaction. And if we can get over the notion that you've got to do mainstream or you aren't a square dancer, 
and instead say you are a square dancer when you come through the door the first night, and we'll show you how to interact effectively with other people. Uh, we have a wonderful tool. So far, we have had tunnel vision, and unless you're willing to do it with our number of calls and in the way we have always done it, we are not willing to play. Uh, I think we need to get over that. Uh, I'm beyond the stage where I'm willing to go and demonstrate that it works, but I have no doubt whatsoever that it would work. Virgil Forbes again from Maryland. Jim, thank you for reminding me. Uh, last year I had a group from the local Baptist church that called and said they wanted to have a foot fellowship. They didn't want to call it dancing. They, their foot fellowship. And, and, you know, we had five or six couples and we managed to meet, you know, it, it, they checked on Sunday right after the sermon to see who was available Thursday night. And then they called me and said, well, we're dancing this week or we aren't. Uh, so in no way can you call it a class. It was just a fellowship that did some dancing. Okay, it lasted for about six months. I think I got in like 10 or 11 nights across six months. And that was fine. And they had a good time. And then they were going to go do something else. But at the moment, I have a core of five or six couples who at some point in the future may decide they want to do it again. So if we're thinking about, I want to build my class, I want to build my club now, I won't say forget it. Let's just say that that may be a little short-sighted. Uh, you know, we do demos, we do parades for community awareness. And there's nothing wrong with doing a two, three, four dance session for community awareness without adding to the club. Do I want to add to my club? Absolutely. Do I want to have big classes? Absolutely. But that cannot be our sole goal. Uh, Ruth Edison, I think one of the things that turn people off is that they're pressured by our older students to join a club. We have a new fellow. He's been dancing maybe a year, and uh, we had uh, invited the, some girls up to come because we were going to do a uh, girl, girl Scout and their Daddy's uh, function, and uh, they uh, wanted to see what you know Ron would do with the people, and. Um, Right away, one of this, this fella went over to them and tried to pressure them into signing up and taking classes. And, you know, I went over and I said, Billy, forget it. I said, they're here just to observe and maybe they will do it afterwards. But don't pressure them. It's not going to work. I think many of our outreach activities we can look at as planting seeds. Maybe it's going to be just a small church core group. Maybe it will develop into a class. But we all, we have, no matter what we do, we have to keep planting seeds. Be it a parade, be it a, a church demo, uh, outreach. And again, you just have to see where that group wants to go and, and not, not push them. Once you start pushing, I think the human nature is when you start pushing, people start resisting. So uh, just kind of, I guess, go with the flow. Patience and persistence and make sure they're having fun above all else. Correct. Fred Moore, Columbus, Ohio. At uh, my this point, we belong to two clubs. One of them's a single, Bucks and Doe Singles, and the other one is a couples club, which was fast fading away. And the hard part is for the older dancers to persuade them that recruitment is very good among the singles. They have more time and more willingness to come on out. So uh, it took a while, but we also started persuading them that it was very wise to go on, those who danced, to go ahead and learn how to be the boy or the girl. We I had learned at one of the conventions that... Um, Japan had a very large group, and they all learn both parts, not just how to be the boy or the girl. 
and we started telling the ladies, if you take and learn both parts, you never set out unless by choice. And uh, it went from one to about ten of our ladies are now taking doing both parts, and they really are telling the others how much fun it is not to sit on the chair. Uh, Jim Gallagher from uh, Orlando, Florida. Um, we had some young square dancers in our club that were talking to their parents, and they said, we used to have a red-hot Saturday night. And they said, what was that about? Oh, we'd get two, two callers fast, and they would call, and you didn't sit down. You just kept on calling. And they had people with signs that if you wanted to get stepped out, they would come up with this sign, and that means two more. You know, another couple could come in, and it went like that. Well, <clears throat> the older people that were in the club said, oh, that won't work. We used to do that, and it never worked. So they said, well, could we try it? Well, it's not going to work. And we have our own club. We own our own club. So they said, well, I'll tell you what. We'll rent the hall, and we'll get some callers in. Now, the callers are a little sensitive people, too. Yeah. Now, they got an attitude. Now, we do raids in our area, and we go around maybe 60 miles radius, and we have contact with a lot of clubs. And uh, if you get a caller from that club, everybody dance to all of these callers. So you need to get somebody from out of town. Tony Oxidine, you know what I'm saying like this here. But even him, is he's been around a lot. He's getting to be a little old. Huh? But we got some. I'm not sure he wants to hear that. but <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sure he wouldn't like that. He wouldn't like that. And that's it. But anyway, we got a couple of fast callers. And they come in, and we put our flyers as we did our raids. You know, we raid other clubs. I, don't, I guess you all know what a raid is, right? Yeah. And we did that. We put our flyers. And we had 22 squares. Yeah. And it was marvelous. And it was a good fundraiser for our club. But these old people, oh, that, and then the local caller, well, why do we have to get, oh, I'm, you know, he's there you got to get an out of town. And they want to know when we're having another one. So all being well next year, we'll have another one. But you got to be, you know, receptive to go on to new things and get things done. Yeah, yeah. And new things, try some of the old things again, reinvigorate uh, yeah. the activity. Yeah. Now, did you ever hear of a red-hot Saturday night? Years ago you did, did you? I'm asking you, you're old. You've been around a little bit. Or you're not that old. Yeah, oh, okay. I'm not you that just old either. That old. You just look that old. Okay. All right, so that's the name of that tune. <laughs> Tom, let's go to the back first, somebody new, and then we'll come back up here. Well, I just want to know what a raid was. Is, it's, is it like banner stealing, traveling? Oh, okay, same thing. Okay. Okay, now we can come back up front. Just to kind of follow up, this is Stephen Cole from Tempe, Arizona. One of the things that I have found in the bunch of years that I've been dancing and calling is that there is something to be said for a special dance that is not a, a local caller. I mean, I, I uh, yes, uh, it's true that my feathers get ruffled. When we, What's wrong with me? Come on. I can do this. I can do what you want. But when you have a special event, then become special for everybody there's a, a club up in the seattle area that has us they have a it's like a fancy dress ball they come out and they, they say dress to the nines i mean not necessarily tucks and tails but pretty close when you have a special event it changes the atmosphere and it's funny because some callers will tell you you know what a different def definition of an expert caller is 50 miles 
If you go 50 miles, suddenly you're out of your own area and suddenly you're a different person and you can almost step it up and be that much more showy. But if you did that same dance every week, it loses its flair, its special specialness. So there's and but you can still use that, I think, as a, a stepping stone to do other things. So maybe this week it's it's the the red hot dance and next week it's something else. But if you bring some new people in. Now that said, you say next week we're gonna have uh Tom Rudabach is coming back. I mean, we'd like to make sure that he's taken care of. And you want to take care of your, your callers because they're your teachers and your, they're your special people that, that, that take care of your club's care and feeding week to week. Um, and it's always good to acknowledge the callers that you know. But it's always good to have special things to make it a special event, to, if nothing else. And I don't like to trick dancers, but sometimes you trick their sensibility just a little bit to, to make you think, hey, new and improved. Colgate comes out with new toothpaste. Do you think it's new? It's probably the same formula that it was 50 years ago. But they put sparkle crystals in it and whitening crystals in it. And it's the same toothpaste, for God's sake. So take your same square dance and add sparkling crystals to it and whitening crystals to it and whatever other crystals you can find. So it's uh, – go ahead. Get the microphone back there. Betty Dutcher from Lamars, Iowa. We were contacted about two months ago from a teacher in a college and wanted to know if she could bring some students to our square dance. Wanted to know if they could dance a couple tips. So we approached our club and we approached different uh, people that come to our dance and I said, this is what we'd like to do. And they said, no problem. They came Friday night, uh, four girls and their teacher and they had a ball. And I think if we open this up and do a little of this and let them come and have some fun and learn what square dancing's about before we approach lessons, it might help a lot. That's, that's outreach that, that has come up. Uh, so it, I want to continue this discussion, but uh, I'm curious as we continue if anybody in here wants to comment on something they've heard in here today that they hadn't heard before and if they think they might be able to take it back and talk to somebody else about it. Because when we get together in a forum like this and share these ideas, it's what we do with these ideas. And so this is taped and so people can hear it. Uh, it becomes a report of this session. So if there's something to pick up on by a committee or something else to help uh, provide that impetus. But even more important from a grassroots point of, point of view is if the people in this room are hearing something that they say, hey, that's, I hadn't thought about that before and I want to take that back. So I'm just curious what you're thinking at this point. With that, uh, we got another hand in the air. Virgil Forbes from Maryland again. Actually, the the one that's really tripped my interest right now is using the YMCA. Uh, I was at a, a park and recreation gathering a couple of weeks ago in Maryland. They call it a bowl roast. That's a all-you-can-eat-for-all-you-can-pay kind of thing. It's a fundraiser. Uh, and I actually had a chance to sit down with the secretary of the local park and recreation council, and this council has had two or three square dance and round dance clubs as member organizations for 35 years. But Park and Rec themselves has never organized or sponsored a square or round dance. Uh, so I'm talking to her now. Now, it's a, it's a little out of my way. I'm trying to figure out where I can get a caller because she has mailing lists and she has flyer rights in all the elementary and middle schools in her district, which is something we haven't had as square dance clubs, is the right to send out flyers to every student in the school that we dance in. Okay, So the idea of using the rec council and their mailing list, their membership list, using the YMCA and their membership list. Anybody remember oh, six or eight years ago, we were all talking about the Chicago plan for recruiting, which the gay clubs have used to great uh, effect. And the idea was building a mailing list, building a contact list. And if somebody's going to give me a contact list or at least 
take my material and send it to their contact list, which I think is going to be the more preferred option, uh, I'd be a fool not to take it. Because we all know if we advertise, what, 400 flyers out, you might get two or three responses. Well, if I can get somebody else to do 400 flyers and get two or three responses, gee, that makes six. That's the start of a class. Other hand in the air back there. Yeah, Ron Shane from Louisville, Kentucky. Um, Lexington, Kentucky, you brought up something about the park and recreations. Um, in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, the Fayette County Park and Recreation Board has been working with their square dance community, uh, clubs for quite a few years, and they do that. They mail out to their mailing list uh, each year, and that's where they've been drawing for years for uh, for lessons was through the park and recreation. They provide... Um, uh, facilities for for the uh, Kentucky Square Dance Association to uh, have our uh, association dances in that area, and they also provide uh, uh, for, uh, facilities for some of the clubs at reduced rates because of uh, their association. And they have a a monthly newsletter that they mail out at their expense to anyone that wants to get on their um, on their mailing list. So that's another option there too. Uh, check with your local park and recreation uh, departments because they they can help you. And then another thing was uh, about the churches. You brought up about the churches. I know most of our clubs in our area. I don't know about other areas, but ours dance mostly in church uh, halls. And I've been telling the ones our local clubs, why don't you try to get a fellowship time with that congregation? You know, provide them with uh, uh, social time, uh, exercise time, whatever would work with that con- that particular congregation. Uh, since you're renting their hall, why don't you try to get into that congregation and get some of your participation, provide them with some of the, some of the services they might be uh, uh like to have for for their for the people in their congregation. Strikes me that that's where you could tie up, tie together the idea of say once a month. If you if you dance every week, okay. uh, you might not get that congregation to join your club. But what if you had an open night once a month and really got the congregation knowing that once a month they could come out and dance with no pressure and just have fun. Jamail uh, from New Hampshire again. Uh, Caller in our area has been trying a new approach, which I'm very enthusiastic about. Paul Cody has started a group, which is an open group, meets weekly, open to anybody every time it meets. He's not trying to make a progressive square dance program. He's doing very much what we did in the old days, working with a vocabulary of a half a dozen calls. And if he wants to teach a new one one week, it's after that week only. Uh, it's a different attitude. It's a different approach. He's not trying to build a club. Um, so far, he's been doing it uh, no charge, uh, putting out a pot for donations, and he says he's doing very well with the donations that it is contributing. He's been running three or four squares of people who come pretty regularly, and he does a repetitive program. He doesn't dance a whole lot of stuff. He's not taking them to any kind of a program. Uh, I continue to believe, uh, stubbornly, as many people think, that we are so fixated on our multi-call program that we forget that just moving to the music with a very limited number of calls can be a wonderful social experience. And if we could somehow refocus our attention from... Uh, mastering our vocabulary to enjoying each other's company, uh, I think we have an infinitely versatile program uh, or activity that can be fun. Uh, I, I don't think we have to have all the calls that we do, and I don't think it has to be traditional dancing. Traditional dancing is a style of square dancing where we teach routines. The people dance a memorize, they me- learn the routine. Uh, we have a different product. We, in modern square dancing, teach a few terms, and then we create variety with those terms. You can create variety with a half a dozen terms. You don't need 70 of them. 
and Paul's making it work. I don't mean to overuse the word outreach, but that sounds to me like another example of outreach, and outreach is the way I'm hearing it right now is not tied to a program. It's just getting people in the hall and working with them to have a great social fun night. Who's next? I think one of the things, and, and, and I, I keep hearing the outreach, but tied more toward it may be an, an active club or federation, come up in our, our marketing meeting this morning, or selling your business, building your business. I think one of the things we need to look at is more cooperation between clubs. This club wants to go their way. Don't you dare steal my members that we're going over here. And I, I, this is going to have to come probably from a federation level on down to, to where we get cooperation among clubs to help each other. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, and we'll all benefit from it. Good. Virgil Forbes again. Let me take a totally different tack. Um, unapologetically, I am a club caller of mainstream and plus square dancing. I love doing, we'll call it outreach, I love doing the, the things that are not destination aimed, but I am primarily a club caller. Um, one of the things I have one of my clubs looking at now to promote next fall's class, I've told them, you set up a square dance party at your church, at your community hall, block party, and I'll come down and do it for real cheap. I won't do them for free because people in today's society think whatever you're giving them is worth what they're paying for it. And if you're asking for free, they don't think much. Okay, That's a philosophy. It's not universally shared. That's fine. But I'll come down and do their church, their block party, their community association for a very modest fee comparatively because I want to build toward starting our class in September. So I've already got three dances scheduled for, or three parties scheduled for August. I want at least a dozen because that, giving them a good time at a square dance party, is my best ad advertisement for starting class. Okay? Uh, and again, I'm using our established network to do this. Uh, for others, for why, for park and rec, you know, you're, you're off on no support from our established dancer community. And this is, of course, Jim and I are going to discuss this at one o'clock. The difference between using our established networks and trying something that are not covered by our established dancers. So it's, it, it's almost two different activities. Square dance based on club, square dance based on community outreach, if you would. It seems to me, though, that they're not necessarily incompatible if you've got a club that, as part of their activity, is a constant, persistent outreach piece to it as well. I would like to say yes, but I haven't seen many clubs that way. Uh, we have been using, and frankly using and abusing, the same group of dance leaders for years. They have been organizing weekends. They have been club presidents, some of them on their third and fourth term. They've been on the federation board three or four times. They've been on committees for the festival more times than some of them want to count. They are, they are very happy with the activity that they are in. They don't necessarily want to change activities to this community-based, uh, limited vocabulary, to use Jim's word, uh, they want to dance what they have fun with, which is not the limited vocabulary community dance, okay? So it's almost like we have two sure. different products that we're peddling here. Sure, it would be a paradigm shift, but I could see a mainstream club, hopefully, if, if it all worked well, healthy, running classes, but also that occasional 
not for a class, but just to keep it alive that we've got a door open and you come out and dance. Now, ultimately, some people will just stay there. Ultimately, some people might move into the class. But, I mean, I could see it as a another component, a constant component of a club. But it would be a bit of a paradigm shift. It, it would be, especially I'm in the metro area where plus is the standard club level. Week plus, I will grant you for most of them. Uh, but I'm not seeing that much outreach from our established clubs. What I'm seeing is a few of the younger club members saying, hey, let's do something different. Yeah. So we have some more hands in the air, so that's good. <laughs> I'm going to talk some more about this at 1 o'clock, but uh, one of the winning ways that's on the Color Lab website is a story about the Sage Swingers in Brunswick, Maine. Uh, they have for now nearly a decade declared themselves in a solidly plus area to be a mainstream club. And the solidly plus area has lost plus clubs at a steady rate over that decade. Well, the Sage Swingers now uh, have just graduated a 16-couple class. They average uh, 8 to 10 squares at their weekday weekly meeting, and on the weekend, once a month dance, they draw 12 to 14 squares. Uh, they are operating very much like the clubs I knew 25 years ago. They are equally successful. They have to fight with the area clubs to have them run a mainstream dance so that they can bring two busloads of people on a banner raid. They have to fight. They have to beg. Uh, there's something wrong with our picture. They have demonstrated repeatedly, steadily, that a different approach will work. The existing... Uh, population of square dancers are, in my mind, so firmly established in their own views that it's very difficult to interest them even in something that has been demonstrated to be successful. Fred Moore, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, he asked earlier if we picked up something that was said that was of interest of using and I really liked the sparkle in the toothpaste same old thing let's do it there's been a lot of other great ideas but the sparkle kind of stuck with me that uh, we have got a great thing going but let's put a little sparkle in it I think a couple pick comments I picked up here is, is, is having fun and Working with fewer basics, I'm sure none of the other none of the callers in this room would have that problem. But we have callers out there that can't call a dance unless they're calling all the plus figures because they have not done their homework. Now take me out and shoot me. I don't know if this was addressed before we I got in here, but I haven't heard anybody talk about. Uh, the square dance attire, that is the biggest roadblock for me of getting anybody into square dancing. They, they, they see the, they see pictures and any kind of advertising they see. That's what they're talking about. I don't want to wear those clothes. I want to be able to dress casually like we're all dressed, uh, dressed here. And it seems like the outreach things work really well because those things typically aren't required, I assume. Um, but, but, but they just don't want to get into club dances because that's what's required. How do you get, I don't, I don't know what to tell them. I don't know what to tell them past that. For the record, that was Kathy Mears of Kansas. Virgil Forbes again. Actually, my, my first night of class, especially my accelerated, I give them Virgil's dress code. You must be dressed. Uh, it, it is indeed in our club. There's, a big debate between those who want a costume for the dance and those who just want to walk in from dinner. And my answer is, I don't care. Come dance. Uh, costuming can be a lot of fun. Uh, and especially for special dances, it can be a lot of fun. But that's one I don't think any club is ever going to solve to its own satisfaction of a hundred percent of the members i'm sorry you know that's that's one we're going to fight about for years and i don't want to waste any time over it so my class i enforce virgil's dress code 
Uh, Ron Shane from Love Again. Um, one thing you'd mentioned about the uh, levels of dance. Uh, we were just we were just approached by um, um, not we, but um, the uh, general chairman Louis Friedlander from De- Detroit Convention was approached by Don Casper of uh, of Germany about having a uh, basic hall. And um, so it's not just a part-time hall. He's going to utilize his, uh, and we will probably offer the same if we talk it over. Um, I never thought of a, a mainstream, I mean a, a basic hall. Um, but we're going to utilize, he's going to utilize his uh, handicapable hall. Since it's only used part-time, by the handy capable people that will free give him an extra hall to use for basic. Um, I know uh, that's one thing that some of our callers in our area had been discussing recently was about because it's hard to get people to commit to 20 weeks of lessons. I know the bowlers have found out years ago already that you can't get bowling leagues, can't expect them to commit for a whole year. So if you could get back, if we could go back to that basic and teach basic first and then go into the mainstream, uh, I think it'd be a lot easier to, uh, to get people, uh, in, into lessons. And did I see another hand go up in the yeah, air somewhere? Yeah, yeah. just to, I reply to him. I happened to be in, it was a, a bog informal where that came up and I happened to be the representative from the board there. The caveat to making that work is putting some of the best callers in, and people will follow them. If you put the newer callers, and I and I not putting newer callers down, but in, but callers that don't know how to work all the, the the put all the things together in an interesting program. I forget the right words. It will attract the people in there. But I yeah, that, I was in that meeting where that was discussed. Jim Gallagher from Orlando, Florida. Uh, I heard Paul Cote uh, mentioned back there. Well, he was one of the callers we had for our Red Hot uh, Saturday night to come. And, uh, you know, he, he's a good caller, wouldn't you say? Yes. And, I mean, he's fun. But the people in the club, they have to go out of their way. Someone, he said, well, I'll call for this much money, and I expect you to pay my to come over, and, which is re- right. And uh, but somebody, sh- we stepped up and we said we'll pick you up at the airport to save that money, and we'll put you up in our home. And we have a just a one extra bedroom, and he's a big guy, and feed him and chauffeur him around. I mean, but a lot of people say, yeah, but oh, see, I can't. I live. I I, I can't. But you have to exert yourself a little bit for these people to save some money. That's it. Okay. We'll still get you. Just the last thing about dress code, uh, Stephen Cole from Tempe, Arizona. Um, I tell my students and dancers of any kind that if your parts are covered and you're clean, you're welcome at my dances. That's pretty much how it works. Um, if you're inappropriate, I'll probably ask you to leave because I don't feel like staring. But <laughs> but the thing, too, is that I also say at any dance where I'm calling, where I am calling that dance, if you come and you are made to feel unwelcome, come see me. I will fix it. I will make it better. Don't don't fight with anybody else. If, if they get in your face and say, you're not wearing a dress and you're not wearing whatever's, not wearing long sleeves, you come see me. I will make it better. I will be your advocate because I'm here for you. I can't do this without you. So, and what has happened is that it, it kind of generates a little bit more of a bond between the dancers that I teach and I. And the, da- and the clubs are realizing, why should we ch- scare off our revenue? And we all can come to a meeting of the minds, me as a dance leader, them as dance leaders as well as their club membership, and them as as dancers. And it's worked out really, really well. I know one club in our area, it is written in their constitution. You will wear square dance attire to all dances. The club is on a downhill slide. 
Red Moore, Columbus, Ohio. I really appreciate that comment because if more callers would do that, there would be less problem from the club members and guests would probably come back more. But my real thing of it is, is we need to start spreading the word that they're going to try a contest at National. It's, I guess, being fought with some clubs, but I really found it a great idea when I heard it that uh, it might be a way to get the youth back in because I'm always hearing when I go to my dentist or somebody else, well, what kind of prize did you get when you went to such and such? Oh, no prize. I just went for fun. But I think the younger people would actually go if they thought they were training for a contest. We've got just a few minutes left. Um, take another couple. You have to have the microphone. Sorry. Uh, Ruth Edison from New Jersey. Um, Dick Maziata used to have a, a basic club, and he asked Tony uh, Oxidine if he would call for it one night. So Tony came and called, and um, he made one goof, and everybody stopped and said, that's not mainstream. <laughs> There used to be a, uh, and I, I'm fam not familiar with it. I understand in, in Northwest United States, there's very strong youth competition. I'm from Ohio, and at, at one time we had a very strong program. Actually, it trickled clear down to the, the Ohio State Fair, and I'm not quite sure. I, I got my personal reasons why it kind of fizzled, but uh, I, there's potential. I think there's some potential. I'm, I'm not. Not totally advocating competition, but I think there's some things we need to look at, especially for our youth. For the purposes of the recording, you want to get the disc on Square Dance is a Competitive Sport that was held Monday, which talked about the Pacific Northwest Teen Festival, which is teen competition, and it's been there for 50 years. Okay. Okay. Um, is there anybody have a burning desire to say one last thing? I think it's pretty close to closing it down. Um, I just have one question. Uh, did you enjoy yourselves today? Yay. I guess maybe two questions. Is there something new to think about? Yes. And three questions. Should we have this session again? Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the convention. <laughs>